was at the show, and again, this is something he, he drags himself out. Of, Proust dragged himself out of bed to go see the show, and uh -huh. Bergat, the uh, the ailing old writer, drags himself out to go see uh, the Vermeer show. Uh -huh. And they're looking at the uh, view of Dill. Sure, the yellow, spot of yellow. And, and he's looking at the spot of yellow. Yeah. And he realizes he just didn't get there. Yeah. This little spot of, you know, this last detail in art, this beautiful lacquer touch was the level of artistry that he never got to. And I'm, I know that that's Proust talking to himself. Yeah. Proust in his cinematograph, cinematographer's mind, because you, you know that he was seeing this movie in front of him. I'm, I feel exactly the same uh, way. Uh, his canvas looked like a Vermeer. Yeah. I think he was seeing a Vermeer detail in front of him for, you know, after, after five years in the courtroom, he was getting pretty high. Yeah. And I think very clear, and I think he was channeling this dream very clearly, and he still couldn't get that patchy yellow. And, you know, that's the fight as an artist is to, you know, give the good fight. Do you, is the patch of yellow possible to achieve? Do you think Vermeer saw the patch of yellow in the Vermeer? Well, I don't know what Vermeer was looking at. I mean, he's probably looking at Rembrandt. Right, like Rembrandt. Yeah. But in yeah. his own work, he says, shit, where's, where, yeah, where's that yeah. yellow? Yeah, I can't, you know. I, can't, I don't get it. You know, and then that, that's, that's it. He, he went as far as he, as he could go. Yeah. But, but the challenge, he lays out, a ch you, you see that the challenge of art is so big. Mm -hmm. Uh... And that's, and, and it's so big and it only comes down to a little patch of yellow. Yeah. It's so big and so useless and so meaningless. And that's a daunting thing to be 24 years old and facing that life of creativity well, as, any, as you're facing. Any reasonable person would give up. I well, mean, as, I, I, as, they, it, as they should. Yeah. You know, beware, don't enter this door. Um, and Th Proust is uh, this astounding mountain. I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to people who did give up after Proust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they say, I can't, you know, what, what's left to say? And Virginia Woolf said that about Proust. Yeah. She said, it's, that's it. I mean, she said that he, this is the greatest adventure in reading. What's left to say? Yeah. So, of course, that's true. And she went on to say something else. Yeah. And yeah. Then on the other hand, of course, you keep going. That's just, uh, you know. It's, it's, it's it, a compulsion, yeah, you know? It, yeah, it's a compulsion. And so, as, as, as a young artist, I mean, what do, you, what do you feel this has equipped you with now to create art? First of all, it's given you a high standard. Yeah. Second of all, it's told you you must um, only come from your instinct, only trust yourself, and you have to have a clear vision. You know? And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, what, what else did it tell you? I mean, what kind of demands has this put you on? Well, I mean, Marcel doesn't see the patch of yellow in his own work. Right. But I see it in his work. You see it. And if I don't see it in my work, which I never will, maybe somebody else will. Maybe you read something that I write and say, that's great. And I'll say, no, you're missing, no, I don't. But who is ever at peace with, with, what, they're, with what they're doing? You know, you have this dream of what you can do, and when does the reality of it ever... Right, it's just, but, you, but you understand what mountain you have to climb. Well, for me, the question is how to make the ultimate Proust movie. That's what I've been thinking about. Uh -huh. And Visconti tried. It was the last project, and he wrote a script, and it didn't happen. And um, there have been some other attempts. Pinter wrote a screenplay. Um, but I've always had this dream that Proust could have made this movie. If, if that was a reality for him. And the whole idea of the magic lantern and the cinema of his literature. And the shifting perspectives. Sure, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and he presupposed movies. I think so. Yeah, I absolutely. really do. Um, so that would be the mountain that I'd like to climb. I looked at Monsieur de Charlus. Undoubtedly his magnificent head, though repellent, yet far surpassed that of any of his relatives, you would have called him an Apollo grown old. But an olive-hued, bilious juice seemed ready to start from the corners of his evil mouth. As for intellect, one could not deny that his, over a vast compass, had taken in many things which must always remain unknown to his brother Germant. But whatever the fine words with which he coloured all his hatreds, one felt that 
even if there was now an offended pride, now a disappointment in love or a rancor or sadism, a love of teasing, a fixed obsession, this man was capable of doing murder and of proving by force of logic that he had been right in doing it and was still superior by a hundred cubits in moral stature to his brother, his sister-in-law or any of the rest. Just as in Velasquez's lances, he went on, the victor advances towards him who is the humbler in rank, as is the duty of every noble nature. Since I was everything and you were nothing, it was I who took the first steps towards you. You have made an idiotic reply to what it is not for me to describe as an act of greatness. But I have not allowed myself to be discouraged. Our religion inculcates patience. The patience I have shown towards you will be counted, I hope, to my credit, and also to my having only smiled at what might be denounced as impertinence, were it within your power to offer an impertinence to me, who surpasses you in stature by so many cubits. But at least, and this is the conclusion which I am entitled to draw from the last words that we shall exchange on this earth, at least I intend to hear nothing more of your calumnious fabrications. So far I had never dreamt that Monsieur de Charlus's rage could have been caused by an unflattering remark which had been repeated to him. I searched my memory. I had not spoken about him to anyone. Some evildoer had invented the whole thing. Chandler and Proust. Because of those big, rich metaphors. You know, Chandler references Proust in The Big Sleep? No, I didn't know that. He references Proust. I think one of the girls, one of the fatals, Lauren, B the character Lauren Bacall plays in the movie. Right, you know, Marcel Proust. Something right, like she did do that. You remember that? Yeah. He, he was a writer. Yeah. yeah he, he, and then he didn't know who it was. Right, right. Right. Um, Marlo, Marlo had no idea. Well, uh, Proust is a detective. Yeah. Right. Proust is a detective. He's a private eye. That's to and he's a total voyeur, like he's Marlo. He's a total voyeur. Yes, it's, it's voyeurism. That's, yeah. the, that's the relationship between Marlo and Proust. And he's a sadomasochist, just yeah. like Marcel. Right. Uh, um, the mystery is, of course, how I got here. You know? That, for me, is the mystery. The mystery of me, in, yeah. in Proust. Yeah. And in, in Chandler, it's the mystery of who shot so, such and such in the thing and stole the... But, of course, it... it you know, like any great detective, he gains some sense of self-knowledge. Um, and language, those rich, uh, those yeah. rich, overblown metaphors of... Um, they're blondes and then they're blondes. There's the Zulu, there's... I can't go on, but that whole passage in The Long Goodbye, all the different kinds of blondes. Yeah, and that's very Proustian. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that's, that's so Proustian. I, uh, I was... Uh, and, and, and Proust was very big about not being lazy with language. Uh, he, he'd get angry if people used metaphors just reflexively rather, For their own sake. rather than metaphors to communicate. Yeah. And uh, I, I came across a, a section today where he was um, talking about uh, uh, the, the, the Baron, uh, the Baron Charlus, uh -huh. and, and the Baron was face started to have a. He, he talked about it as if it was a sunny day on the ocean and suddenly his face was, uh, the waves were uh, frothing and sea monsters were coming out. Yeah. And so he, he sets up the metaphor and then a little later he's saying, and then the sea monsters were calming down. And then, so he starts with the metaphor, lays it out, and a little later as the description goes on, he goes back to the metaphor, back to the face, and it's changing a little bit. The surface of the yeah. face is changing and he goes back, well, wow. That's the musical side of that's like that's wow. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what writing is because suddenly you're seeing in metaphors yeah. and thinking in metaphors, and that's uh, again Chandler was all metaphor. The goofier, the better. The better, the yeah. bigger, the better, and he build it to where you thought he couldn't add the cherry, and he always just added the cherry to his thing. And so beautiful language. When it was done, did you feel it was too short? Yes. <laughs> It's too short, but it starts all over again. That's true. And I, I could add that I finished the book on the day that I got on the plane to go to Paris because I wanted to begin my own tracing of Proust in, in France. Uh -huh. And I 
couldn't get any of my friends in Paris to take the side trip with me. And I got on the train to go to Combray, um, which is where the novel begins. Right. And um, I don't speak much French. I take this long train ride. I don't know where I'm going. And I get there, and I walk off and get into the city and find my way up to the Proust Museum, which is where the novel begins, at Tante Le Leonie's house. Yeah, Leonie's. Yeah. And Leonie's. And it's closed. <laughs> Perfect. And I broke in. Okay. And uh, I, I got, uh, uh, I started crying, and I was begging them. Someone came in and found me, and I couldn't speak much French, and I ultimately got a, a private tour of the place. But my love of Proust was so strong, that I actually, I've never trespassed in my life, let alone break into a national monument, but that's what it got me to do. The calling was big. Yeah. I'm um, Baby, that's an episode of the Mr. Bear Show, The Proust Experience, Sam Wasson. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love talking about this. <laughs> the right idea. Blackstone Audiobooks Got a bill. presents Coops, Coops. Trouble. a Lost new audio novel to take by Stan B. Bear. Before and every place, there was a bill like, like everywhere else. Woe for the exception. America Woe rules because of one big no shopping mall. Where anyone might be a regular place. Dada Bill. Off the map. Dada Bill. Dada Bill. Dada Bill.